So, um, very welcome to this very last uh, session of Escada 2020. So, it's been a very different experience uh, this year, and uh, I would have never imagined uh, I'd be connecting from my own home uh, to speak to you and to be with you in this session. But I'm sure, as for most of you, so many things happened this year that we just could have not imagined at all. So, um, in any case, I'm very glad you're connected to this session. And uh, in the session with me are uh, Amrish Baju, Chikwe Ikweazu, Carl Reddy and Adam Roth. So uh, we'll introduce the speakers uh, just before their uh, talks, but I first uh, will introduce uh, Amrish and myself. So my name is Suzanne Hane. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I trained in the Netherlands and then did EPIET in Wales. Uh, that was in cohort five, so a long time ago, uh, 1999. And after my time in Wales, I trained further in, in Collendale in London in uh, public health and then went back to the Netherlands, where I'm currently still working in the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, RIVM or RITHM, as some people call it. And uh, there I am the head of the Department for Early Warning and uh, Surveillance. So with me is uh, Amrish. Amrish is uh, also an alumnus of UFM. And uh, he's president of the EPIAT Alumni Network and is currently working as the team lead for public health surveillance at the Norwegian Red Cross in Oslo. Um, Amrish is also an honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, Amrish and myself are in the scientific committee of the organization of ESCAIDA. So um, I'm glad you're here connected to the session and um, we welcome you to comment and to take part in the session by using the, uh, the chat box in the, uh, the swap card system. So in the session, we'll, uh, it's really uh, dual. We'll be looking back and celebrating uh, 25 years of EPIAT and how good it would have been if we had been able to do that in person with a good personal plenary session and of course uh, an even better party afterwards. But here we are online, so we'll, uh, we'll do our best. And then we're also looking at the future. So we'll do that from different perspectives, from um, Nigeria, a global perspective and also a European perspective, and then considering field epidemiology training. Um, yeah, so that's an outline of the session. So uh, I'd like to hand over to Amrish now. Hello, good day everybody. Um, nice to see you, albeit virtual. As Susan mentioned, we've been a lot of talk in, in the wider network of ESCAIDA participants, uh, ECDC staff and alumni and fellows of In This Change World, how ESCAIDA would have been a beautiful moment to meet each other again, exchange stories and revitalize ourselves again. Um, and we had a lot of plans for ESCAIDA, um, really as this hallmark of 25 years of EPIET looking back but also looking into the future how our epidemiology programs are being changed um, what are the needs in the global world and all of a sudden we were faced with a pandemic where we're all tested uh, in a real extent not just in COVID, but of course on all the other things that still remain um, to kind of gouge the interest of everybody here in, uh, in in also our interest of course like how many alumni do we already have here uh, we have two polls set up uh, which i would like to launch uh, poll number one we kind of want to see how many EPIAT alumni uh, we have in the room. So if you could quickly give us a vote, uh, it's always nice to see for us, especially after our EAN General Assembly yesterday, where we met with over 100 alumni, and it was great to see everybody in video conference. And then our second poll that we have, or actually our second question, is there anyone in the audience from the first five years of the program? Well, we have at least one sitting with us here. Please do cast your vote. In the meantime, I can already, before we go to the results at the end of the session, um, Suzanne and I could also share like a few of our thoughts and around EPIET and our great memories. And um, as you might have seen, there is now a, a few kind of recollection videos made of which one will be shown at the end uh, as a testimony to how great this program has been. Um, and for me, the program is a testament to 25 years of solid European collaboration. Um, 
where politics and um, governments can do different things. The network has always proven to be uh, our greatest way of working together. And I think it's been shown by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, how quickly the network managed to find each other, how quickly we managed to exchange experiences, but also how quickly we managed to support each other. All very informal. And I'm sure without EPIET as a European program and the EPIET associated programs, this would have not been that easy. So that's one of the great things that I cherish from the program, um, the strong technical backbone that we have, but also the very strong informal and warm connections we already have with each other. Suzanne, over to you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, the network, it's really invaluable the way you can access people in different countries in Europe and beyond uh, in an informal way. That's that's so much easier and quicker and more pleasant and also such a good way to get really good information. If it has to be through the formal routes, uh, this is much more difficult. So I think the network is really uh, one of the outstanding aspects of EPIET. Um, more personally, I think uh, EPIET for me has really been a gateway, an opening to so many wonderful people and also uh, lots of good teachers and good material. And actually really um, my favorite field of working. So uh, I started as a clinician and then working in public health, I didn't really know where I wanted to be. And then uh, meeting these very inspiring people and materials through EPIET really changed my life. It's really a life shaping uh, experience not only professionally, but also personally. Really, uh, many things uh, followed on from that. Uh, even the, the choice of dog, I would say. Uh, and <laughs> but that's a minor thing. But uh, really, many things uh, happened uh, over the past 20 years uh, since I got connected. And uh, I, I can only be very grateful for those opportunities and for all these people sharing things and, uh, and making it happen. So, um, yeah, that's... Um, that's my main uh, feeling about the whole program, and it's uh, it's wonderful. We can uh, we can celebrate 25 years because I do recollect times when we were worried it would all stop, and uh, yeah, I'm very pleased that now with ECDC it has gained a really stronger position in uh, in Europe. Thanks, Susan, and um, that also makes us very curious, of course, what everybody else um, thinks, and I'm sure many of the sentiments that have been echoed over the last years, um, and maybe even from the stories that Suzanne and I, the personal testimonies we just gave, um, a lot of people might be able to connect to that. Um, but if you had to describe EPIET in one word, and we want to give that back to the audience, uh, we're giving you a word cloud here, um, and please try to describe EPIET in one word, and hopefully at the end of the um, session, we'll have a really nice word cloud um, that kind of gives a testimony on what we value um, in this network and within these programs and how we can keep on cherishing it. So making ensuring that the program remains strong, that it gains the additional investments, but also that it remains strong as a network um, for the alumni, for the fellows, but also for the wider member states and the public health institutes in Europe and beyond. So over to you, Suzanne. Yeah, so I think uh, we're a little bit ahead of time, but that's good. Uh, so we'll, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chikwe Ikweazu. Um, he's the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And um, Chikwe trained in Nigeria, completed Master in Public Health in Germany, then worked at Robert Koch Institute and also in the UK. And then in 2003, he started EPIAT training in the UK in the Southwest. So um, then completed public health specialization in the UK and then uh, working in, in, in many countries in Africa and currently heading that important institute in Nigeria. So I think Chikwe is an example of, um, of many things, but also of, of how EPIAT can contribute to public health, not only in Europe, but also beyond. And um, yeah, we met about 15 years, I think, ago in, when both training in the UK and uh, yeah, it would have been good if we had been able to meet in person in Poland, but uh, second best option is to meet in the session. So Chikwe will talk about FTP in Nigeria and uh, yeah, over to Chikwe. So thank you very much, uh, Susan, uh, and really thank you to everyone that's put uh, SkyDid together and the, the team that keeps contributing voluntarily to manage the network. I think EPIET, by no doubt, has the strongest alumni network of any of the field EPI training programs around the world, if that's 
I don't think we have any competition around that. Uh, but, you know, the, before I just say a few things to put a bit of what I'm going to speak about in context, you know, my FPN journey obviously started in the southwest of the UK. I was the first fellow uh, in a regional site in the, in the UK. I think it may have been one of the first regional sites at all. Um, so the, there's something to learn from that. Um, I'm in cohort nine, although I did my introductory course uh, with cohort 10 because I kind of did not make the cut initially and kind of had a late <laughs> acceptance into the program. And therefore I missed the introductory uh, modules with uh, my, uh, uh, my cohort. And so I had this incredible connection to two cohorts in FPS, which I think is unique in its own right. And then I started a training site in the southeast of England uh, as a, a site supervisor. And that in itself grew and uh, quite a number of uh, my trainees are proud, Ettore, a few of them within uh, um, ECDC at the moment. But then I think you taking the European experience to South Africa, where I then joined Carl in, in the in supporting the South African field epi uh, training program for the years I was there. And then being called up suddenly, really without uh, much warning, to lead a new small organization at the time uh, that was called the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And, and maybe that's a good place uh, to now start. Um, just added one slide with the mandate of NCDC. Uh, this would be kind of fairly familiar with every for everyone on this in this conference, I imagine. But I think the important thing is is that the first few years of my tenure was spent trying to get a legal mandate for the institute. So at the time I came, we didn't yet have a, a legal mandate. It was kind of formed outside of the ministry and started. But I quickly realized that without a strong legal mandate, we couldn't really do the work that we were expected to do. And this is something a few of the countries trying to set up MPIs are struggling with, and I've struggled with particularly during the outbreak, when you do need a bit of authority uh, to get the work you need to get done done. Uh, so we spent our time uh, getting a mandate to do the things you see on the slide at the, you know, around surveillance and outbreak control research and IHR, including specifically uh, leading on field epi training program, uh, field epi training in Nigeria. We're located on three campuses, and those are the pictures on the right in Lagos and Abuja, and the one in the middle is our national reference lab on the outskirts um, of Abuja. Um, with a, a population of 200 million, one of the highest population densities in the world, in the middle of the tropics with socioeconomic indicators that we are not particularly proud of. Um, we've had a lot of work to do with um, emerging, re-emerging infectious diseases over uh, many years. And, and this work will continue uh, as long as the, the, the broader determinants of infectious disease emergence remain what they are. Um, from the Ebola outbreak in 2014, which was kind of a, a big success for public health in Nigeria, rightly so, in terms of our ability to manage that, and that was kind of acknowledged globally. Um, but I think sometimes over, maybe over celebrated a little bit because, you know, we still had a lot, a long way to go. In 2016, uh, three weeks before elimination of polio in Nigeria and then on the continent, because we were the last country with circulating wide polio virus. We found this new outbreak of four cases that, you know, literally took us back and almost killed off whatever enthusiasm was left um, around uh, polio eradication. But, you know, we pulled our socks up and kept working. And this year, we we're able to uh, declare wide polio virus eliminated in, in Nigeria and in Africa. We still have a, a challenge with vaccine-derived poliovirus uh, on the continent, obviously. But as we started building, we started detecting more uh, infections. You know, we found the first many 
Uh, firstly, now the big meningitis outbreak in 2017, uh, driven mostly by MENC, or of MENC. Then we found monkeypox, you know, a, a disease that I, even I had never heard about, had never seen a case of. The first case in 30 years. And then we saw a fairly large outbreak of it. And then when we did the epidemiological investigations and linked it to sequencing, we found an interesting phenomenon. This wasn't a point source. This wasn't uh, a reintroduction. It seemed like there were, you know, many sequential introductions from uh, whatever the host animal was, which we still don't know, into human populations. And so if that was happening, the most likely explanation is that monkeypox must have been circulating quietly in Nigeria for many years, and maybe our surveillance systems are just not able to pick them up. And then the same thing happened with um, uh, with uh, with yellow fever. Not even on this graph. We saw the first found the first case in 17 years, and since then we've um, found more. Every year we report the largest Lassa fever outbreak ever. <laughs> we're not finding more. We're finding more cases of Lassa that have been there already. So as you improve the sensitivity of your surveillance system, as you improve your laboratory capacity, especially in countries like ours suddenly you have a lot of work to do year on year. And that's really been uh, what we've faced in Nigeria, obviously, till this year when we had this uh, COVID pandemic that everyone has been dealing with. Now, a few slides on the history of Nigeria's field and laboratory training program. We've kept the laboratory component as part of our training. Firstly, this is obvious to many people, the evolution of the EIS programs to the FELTIP programs, the first program in Africa in 93 in Zimbabwe, EPIET in 95, and then Kenya set up this FELTP in 03, and, and Nigeria set up its field EPI training program in 2008. Um, the, the, the field EPI training program in Nigeria is now 11 years old with uh, 400 residents and graduates. Um, we train about 50 a year. It sounds like a lot, but remember, we're a country of 200 million. Um, so far, we've only admitted people that are already working somewhere in the public sector. So it might be states, universities, federal, disease program, but it's been limited till now for uh, to only those already in the public sector. We have the three streams, but the intermediate is just about to start, so we haven't had that over these uh, years, and three tracks around medicine, medical track, veterinary track, and the lab track. It's been an incredible source of expertise for the public health landscape in Nigeria. It's hard to imagine what public health would have been like in Nigeria without uh, the NFLT uh, program. And it's hosted now by uh, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, which uh, wasn't always the case uh, in the past. Um, 2018, we got our definite accreditation, which everyone was excited about. And, um, you know, lots of people have graduated from the program to fill a leadership position across uh, the public health landscapes from commissioners, which is the highest level in the state. At the state, we have 37, 36 plus one, 37 federal states, both in the public health side and on the veterinary side. Um, we have 30 graduates now working within NCDC, an incredible resource. The incident manager for the COVID response in Nigeria uh, was a Feltip graduate. Uh, so all sorts of fellows across all levels of the organization are really driving the emergence and development of uh, field epi and uh, the, the content, the culture, the ethic of what we represent. A state epidemiologist in 15 of our 37 states have been NFELTIP graduates and, you know, colleagues working around the vertical disease program. So a huge resource um, for public health uh, in Nigeria. You know, what struck me moving back to Nigeria, just understanding our level of development generally, you know, if, when you go through a, a field epi training program in the UK, uh, in Europe, you know, I guess a lot of our work, a lot of my work at the time, both as a fellow and a supervisor, was spent really on, you know, small studies around small outbreaks and not that many infectious diseases anymore. So we can, you know, do an extortionate amount of work on a few cases of E. coli or norovirus or whatever 
you know, we find and, you know, do elaborate uh, statistical uh, the models, and, and rightly so, because when things are so rare, you have to investigate them in detail, and that's what we're trained to do. And you have to find uh, risk factors that we can debate on methods and things like that. You know, in our context, I quickly realized that, you know, we've got to build the basics. So a, a lot of fellows in Nigeria very often takes a while to get to that level of need because the needs are a lot more basic. You need to train people on infection prevention and control in standard processes to do it well, do it diligently, learn from it, improve on it. You know, so it's a different level, but it's not less important. In fact, it's more important because that's the need of the system here at the moment. So the program, the, the courses we deliver, the emphasis is a little bit different in terms of what we deliver, what we teach, and how we improve public health through the improvement, the measuring, the monitoring of the improvements that we push. So it's not any less tasking, it's actually even not less intellectually challenging as you might assume. But this is the work that has to be done here and actually has to be done in many other countries around the world to get to where we want to do so where we want to go and we when you bring that um when you bring the ethic and the the knowledge and capacity that you need for a complex outbreak investigation into managing the supply chain for ppes you know it does improve the ppe distribution mechanisms in a way that in ways that are sometimes difficult to budget so that's the ethic and that's a lot of the work really that we've been focused on uh, in Nigeria over the past uh, few years across the public health sector. So a, a few words around the future of, of the program. A few years ago, we marked 10 years of the Nigeria Field Epi Training Program, and we knew that the, you know, the capacities, the thing, the instincts you needed to birth the program, to develop it, to assert yourself over the first 10 years, is definitely not what you need for the next 10 years. So I, I was in cohort uh, nine uh, in Epiet. I think I was the last, we were the last cohort with a, a gentleman named Alain Moren, who many of you will know. And, and at that time, Epiet was changing. Epiet was moving out of a standalone program, becoming a program within ECDC. This is exactly the same point I found the Enfelted program moving out of the ministry, a program that was largely driven by donor funds and support from the US CDC, to a program hosted within a national public health institute that was newer than the field epi training program, which was older. So transitions is really, are really important. And 25 years of epi, we really have to think about what that means uh, for us. So it brings me to my first point, thinking about the future. In countries where there are national public health institutes, it seems like the most natural thing in the world. But there are many countries that don't have one. And if you don't have a national public health institute, um, you know, it's very difficult to do field epidemiology with the authority it needs, with the compliance, with the delivery mechanisms, with the stature that we need for the future. So I, I think within this EPIAT family and the broader family, we have to become the biggest advocates for strong national public health institutes. Because it's only through national, strong national public health institutes that we can bring all of these functions that normally would be floating around uh, the health sector, the public health sector, into one organizational leadership. Because you can't do good surveillance without a good public health laboratory architecture. You can't plan an EOC if the EOC doesn't have the mandate within an MPI to deliver. So all of these components are extremely inefficiently delivered if they're delivered outside an MPI. And we don't often raise our voices sufficiently in, in making this, driving this point to the wider, wider, uh, uh, wider audience that for whom this is not kind of uh, obvious already. Um, so as we have built this, there are many ways to do this. We now have ours here really bedded into NCDC. 
uh, you know, we, we preach uh, what we do. We have big conferences. We align. We're part of uh, the leadership of the ministry. So really building a community and building a vision around a strong MPI is absolutely critical for the future of field epi training program. So, so these are the changes we're planning uh, for the next step of uh, NFLTIP in Nigeria, to fully transit from a donor-funded program to full country ownership. When the program is new, you need to find mentors and supervisors outside of the program. But now, 10 years of graduates, uh, you know, you, you, you barely need mentors outside of the program. So we're going to use graduates for a lot more than we've previously done. The entire program is now really bedded into the organization. When it's a new program, there was a whole um, need for a lot of didactic teaching and all of that. We're moving to a lot more mentor-based training, uh, just like the vision of uh, the field FE training programs in the country that have had many more for many more years. We're going to open it up to the best people in Nigeria and not only those within the public sector. Um, this was, had a bit of resistance, but we've pushed this by starting off the intermediate program to sort out the needs within the public sector and open up the advanced program for the very best so that we can be competitive with the rest of the world like we should be. Um, so these are the changes. Change is always difficult. And these are the changes that we are implementing in Nigeria as we go into our second decade of existence of the field epi training program in Nigeria. But I thought to end with three thoughts uh, that have um, maybe will resonate beyond the work that we're doing in Nigeria and a little bit in, in Africa. Firstly, a lot has been said about our network, but our, our network is of very little value if we don't make it count. So we've got now colleagues working everywhere in the landscape. You know, there's hardly a meeting I go to in WHO or sometimes I get a uh, meet an MSF team or, you know, wherever you go, you see uh, graduates in either the EPIAT alumni network or graduates of one of the many field EPI training programs around the world. But we've got to make this count. And that takes a little bit of an extra step in terms of how do we actually do that. And that's one of the big challenges for all of us uh, as we think beyond 25 years of IPS this is the yes, we've got a great network now. How do we make this count in pushing for the world that we want uh, to see? The, the next, next bit is, is, this is a paper. Uh, there are many things about this. This is a paper that um, these four people put together. It so happened that all four people here um, were either Southwest training supervisors for EPIAT or EPIAT fellows in the Southwest. And, you know, so imagine four of us meeting because we were responding to an Ebola outbreak in Liberia, of all places. Um, so, but that's what a big network does, right? So we came together, and as you do when EPIAT fellows come together, you know, we started talking in the evening about what are we going to learn as a profession from this response. So after the Ebola outbreak, we put those thoughts, we did a survey of graduates and people, epidemiologists that had um, participated in the response, asking what do we need to, uh, what can we learn from this response? And, you know, it was, the, the answer is highlighted in, in black at the bottom. You know, most people say they wanted better cultural awareness, more leadership and management skills. So nothing about better stats, and better epidemiological methods, because, you know, we get all of that and you can train for all of that. That's what the program provides. But how much are we providing ourselves, both through the program and subsequently, with the leadership skills, the management skills, the cultural awareness. You know, before this Ebola outbreak, ECDC was very hesitant. And I, I can say it now because it has changed. But before the Ebola outbreak, ECDC was very hesitant to contribute to outbreak responses outside of Europe. And, you know, I remember a few of us were making the point at the time that it makes absolutely no sense. Um, when you have such an interconnected world, for you to only see Europe as your horizons for intervention around uh, health security. So thankfully that has changed, but it also means that we have to change in how we engage 
uh, with the world. And I, I'm happy that's changing, but you know, um, these are skills that we've now got to build. My final point today is about using our voices. Um, in 2005, uh, when I was an EPIAT fellow, I happened to come back to Nigeria for an outbreak response with Barbara Schimmer, uh, who still works uh, in the Netherlands uh, with Suzanne, I think. Um, you know, and, and we did an outbreak response, there was a big measles outbreak, and we did a retrospective mortality survey, which we also published the outcomes of. But in addition to that, there are many things we saw in Nigeria at the time that we were not happy with. We were investigating a measles outbreak and we were not kind of really allowed access to resources that were within the polio program at the time. And we felt very uncomfortable with this. And, you know, we put this piece together. It was, you know, imagine two fellows getting a, a piece, a reflection piece into the Lancet. So, you know, it was, you know, our first piece like this, but very important. But, you know, it was a bit controversial because we did ask very hard questions at the time and polio was a big program funding a lot of activities. And, you know, there was some unease about um, two fellows, current fellows of the program, writing a piece like this. But we went ahead and wrote this piece. We had to add in a comment here, which um, is not very clear, but you can look up the paper, saying that the views reflected in this article are the views of the of us as individuals and do not reflect the views of Epieta, blah, blah, blah. So, but it was important that we insisted that we did this. And why do I say this today? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges around the way we have been trained, the work that we have to do. There are so many new converts to epidemiology, people that think they know the right thing to do. Um, we see public health institutions that we revere uh, being sidelined in the response. We see a whole public health institute in one of the most important countries in the world being dismantled during the pandemic. And we are looking on the, from, from Africa, looking, looking and saying, listen, how can you dismantle something we're trying to emulate? Um, so, you know, I think there's a critical point for field epi, for health security, for all components of this. And wh whenever I see, I, I listen to my client speak, you know, it kind of gives, gives me back the energy to come back to my job and to fight for the things, the approach that I think are important. And I don't think we can sit behind our computers anymore and just look at the data. We've got to use that data to fight for the things that are important for the world that we want to see. Thank you very much. So that you're was still on mute. Oh. Just, just unmuting, sorry. So thank you, Chiquit. That's, uh, we, that's very inspiring and very important that we, uh, we step out of our, our offices and uh, really um, be advocates of what we believe in and what we, are, what we stand for. And uh, I agree that uh, many shocking things happened uh, due to political forces uh, that shouldn't have happened uh, at all. So, um, yeah, also a great overview of uh, what, you've, what you're building in Nigeria. Uh, we have not that much time, a couple of questions. Um, there's one on the future of uh, field epi training. I think I'll defer that to the session with uh, Adam because we'll talk about competencies and skills. A practical question from uh, Sibylle Remet. Uh, she's asking, uh, so you have the three fields in um, uh, the field epi training, uh, animal, human and lab. And uh, how do these fields collaborate in the routine daily practice? And are there also organizational ties between institutes dealing with these three fields? So thanks and hello, Sibylle. Um, so on your question, firstly, there were the three tracks. We are actually planning to do away with the tracks and merge them, but keep uh, modules in training for each of those within the program, but not have them as three parallel tracks. That's the first thing. The second part of your question on how we work together. 
every day. It, it's hard, I, I will admit. And, you know, the whole One Health concept has been a great term, but the operationalization of One Health is an area where many, many countries have, have struggled with. So, but we are, we're building for the first time, this should have started this year, but COVID derailed it a bit. What we call a new One Health platform where we meet once every quarter. Um, to discuss uh, diseases that are of mutual importance and how to prevent and detect within specific areas like antimicrobial resistance, um, a lot of the responses to the zoonotic outbreaks that we've been dealing with, Lassa, monkeypox, we work together operationally, but in thinking together has been a bit more difficult. And so, just like many countries, we're struggling with that, but we're trying to kind of build uh, not reorganize institutions, but create platforms where we can meet at regular intervals to think about our areas of mutual interest and mutual uh, engagement with each other. Yeah, thank you. I think that's important. And uh, we, we were facing the same issues in Europe, of course, with the One Health concept. So, I think it's time to hand over to Amrish, uh, who will then introduce Carl. Thanks, Susan, and thanks, Chikwe, for, uh, for a great talk showing the interconnectedness of the world and, and maybe especially in this time and age to work more closely together. Um, it's something that connects really solidly to the work that Carl and his team at Definet have been doing globally as well uh, with all regions. Um, of the world. Carl is uh, the director of Tefinet, and actually we had invited Angela Hilmers, uh, the scientific uh, coordinator uh, at, uh, at Tefinet, but unfortunately she is uh, not able to join us, so Carl has uh, kindly stepped in. Uh, Carl, welcome. It's great to see you from this distance. Um, you're going to talk with us about the, uh, the new strategic plan for Tefinet, but also the work that has been done under the Field Epidemiology Learning Advisory Council, which also speaks about objectives we want to achieve as a global village of field epidemiologists and public health microbiologists. I'll give it to you. Thank you very much, Amrish. Um, you know, I'd like to just thank the organizers of Eskida uh, for giving us this opportunity to present. And, you know, just to update you that Angela is actually doing well, so we're very happy with that. And I just can't help but remember how these virtual conferences and meetings are almost like seances. You know, you can I can't see you, but I can feel you there. So I can feel you all there, and it's a pleasure to be here today to chat to you and update you as to Tefinet's activities in supporting field epi of the 21st century. So in 2018, a diverse group of FETP leaders, partners, funders, and other stakeholders met to collectively develop a comprehensive roadmap for improving and accelerating the development of the global FETP enterprise. And the reason why I want to emphasize this point is that Tefinet is a network and we depend on our partners, we depend on our colleagues, we depend on all our stakeholders uh, in order to move forward. And, you know, touching base with our stakeholders is so important because we are a global network at the end of the day. And to emphasize that this is one of our big key work areas, the global FETP enterprise and the roadmap. The first meeting that kicked off this process happened in Belasio in 2018. And in that meeting, a roadmap was developed actually with seven high level recommendations for enhancing, accelerating the development of field epi capacity worldwide. And in, in retrospect, you know, that meeting was actually prophetic because it spoke about addressing the future challenges, you know, to field epi and are we prepared, are FETPs prepared, are regional networks prepared, is Tefinet prepared? And lo and behold, 2020, we faced with the pandemic of COVID-19. This first meeting in Bellagio was followed up by a second meeting in Geneva in 2019. And this meeting added on the eighth recommendation to the previous seven. And it also led to the development of an implementation plan to better connect the ongoing development of global field epi capacity 
to key global health programs and priorities. So out of this meeting, an important decision was made that the TEFINET, the headquarters of TEFINET would serve as the secretariat for organizing the strategic leadership group, which was entrusted to take forward the recommendations of the roadmap. In fact, the first recommendation of the roadmap deals with the creation, the construction of a strategic leadership group to take forward the rest of the recommendations. Okay. Um, we are currently at TEFINET in the last stage of our previous strategic plan. That was the strategic plan from 2017 to 2020. That strategic plan made provision for the establishment of some of our key work areas that we are now very much advanced with. And I'm referring specifically to the TEFI Connect online platform to mobilize residents and graduates of FETPs. I'm talking about the accreditation program, which has subsequently moved on uh, and established really firmly an accreditation process for the two-year FETP training and is now working on an accreditation process for the intermediate course. And of course, there's our learning strategy that was just recently launched. So all of these arose out of the previous strategic plan. We are currently, as I speak, working with a consultant to, who is facilitating the development of our current strategic plan, which will be from 2021 to 2026. It's a five-year strategic plan. And this current strategic plan has taken into account the eight recommendations of the roadmap describing what should be done to advance field epi training programs and how best to go about it. So there is congruency, there is articulation between our new strategic plan, which we are in the throes of finalizing, and the recommendations of the roadmap. So I just want to briefly run through the eight recommendations of the roadmap, just touch upon them. Uh, without reading everything that's on the slide. So as I mentioned, the first uh, activity, the first recommendation was to establish an SLG or strategic leadership group to be the driving force of the enterprise. Secondly, the SLG shall monitor and assure needed improvements and changes in the enterprise. Clearly over time, there has become a need to expand and modernize the FETP core competencies and curricula. I mean, very clearly in the response to COVID-19, certain gaps were highlighted. Uh, our interviews with trainees and trainers and supervisors and mentors indicated the need for, uh, for training in certain aspects of outbreak response. One of the needs that came up was the need for residents to be able to assume leadership and management positions when there is an outbreak or pandemic to manage teams. They felt that that training was not, they didn't get enough training in terms of leadership and management. Also, the issue came up, for example, of uh, risk communication and community engagement. And uh, we've taken steps to actually develop a module in community engagement and risk communication with our counterparts in Canada and in Australia. Thirdly, there's a recommendation that speaks to the development of applied EPI workforce targets at each level of expertise. Fourthly, uh, SLG should assure the development of a cadre, right, of specially trained fellows and alumni that are available for rapid response to health emergencies. Fifthly, the SLG should work to accelerate the rate at which FETPs become fully institutionalized in country. Uh, the original model of the CDC was to build sustainable FETPs in countries and that ownership would pass on to ministries of health or national public health institutes. But the truth of the matter is that many FETPs around the world are not fully institutionalized at yet, as yet and are not fully sustainable, they're still dependent in varying degrees to funding from the CDC in, At in Atlanta. Sixthly, there's a recommendation that talks to the quality of FETPs. And when 
this recommendation goes far beyond the accreditation process. It seeks to address all other aspects of quality of an FETP. So, for example, the ability the, uh, of the mentors and the supervisors to adequately mentor and supervise their, their trainees. Clearly, in any applied EPI uh, shoe leather EPI program, a large proportion of the time, 75 to 80 percent of the time, is actually spent in the field. And mentorship and supervision is actually critical to residents honing their skills and being adequately prepared to deal with all aspects of outbreak de detection, prevention, and response. Um, the seventh recommendation was to assure the sustainability right, of FETP, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, funding in many countries is a is a is a challenge. There needs to alternate funding needs to be sought. Uh, FETPs that are dependent on funding from the CDC ideally should diversify their funding sources. Okay, and finally, the SLG should foster the FETP enterprises articulation with key global health in in. Uh, initiatives because obviously FETP does not exist and cannot function in its own vacuum. It needs to to leverage off, to pivot from other in initiatives of global importance and concern. Okay, I did mention the new strategic plan, right, that TEFINET is busy with at the moment that's been designed to support and guide TEFINET in its role as the secretariat of the strategic leadership group and, of course, the global network of the FETP enterprise. The, the goals, there are four goals of the new strategic plan. And I'm not going to read through everything on the slide, but you can see from the objectives below the goals, you can see the articulation with the recommendations of the roadmap that I've just gone through. So the first goal is, is quality and quality improvement and bearing in mind that this goes beyond accreditation. The second goal is building knowledge and skills. So this articulates with the need of modern FETP trainees and residents who who have different learning needs from previous generations and previous groups. They actually prefer to have their learning materials virtually that they can access at their convenience whenever they would like to, be it via their cell phones, be it via laptops, iPads, iPods. And there's certainly a, a move away from the restrictive face-to-face -face teaching. Modern learners want a lot more than just face-to-face -face teachings in a classroom setting. So clearly there's a need to respond to that learning need. Thirdly, to optimize the workforce network and the alumni. And you'll see there that those objectives uh, articulate well with the uh, recommendations of the SLG. And the fourth goal is organizational and network excellence. And organizational in this goal refers to to TEFINET itself as the global network and the key work areas of, of TEFINET that you know, need to be responsive to the needs of the network and need to facilitate and ensure that the appropriate capacity is built by the residents in training in, in order to respond appropriately to outbreaks and pandemics of the nature of the one that we're currently living through. Okay, so just in terms of, of the updates, in terms of where we are with the formation of the strategic leadership group and the other recommendations of the roadmap. So the strategic leadership group, the two co-chairs of the strategic leadership group come from the CDC, uh, Dr. Rebecca Ryan and Dr. Sorry, Dr. Rebecca Martins and Mike Ryan from the WHO. Uh, politically, as you are aware, there has been, with the current administration in the US, there's been a lot of challenges in terms of its relationship with the WHO. And to an extent, this has, uh, I mean, made it a bit uncertain in terms of our how, how best to proceed. But I think that's a bit behind us now and the path going forward is is quite clear is a lot clearer than it's been so the 
co-chairs have been selected. Uh, we have received an update from WHO that in terms of Mike Ryan's time, he's really busy, really caught up, and they have nominated somebody else from the WHO to be the co-chair. We are currently waiting for approval from both the CDC and the WHO for the letter of invitation to the nominees for the SLG. Once clearance is obtained from both co-chairs, the invitation letter to nominees of the SLG will go out and then we can, based on their responses, we can formally constitute the SLG and have our first virtual meeting. The other thing that has happened is that we've drawn up the charter for the governance for the functioning of the SLG and this charter is also waiting, awaiting final clearance, final approval from the WHO and the CDC. You will realize already that based on the recommendations of the roadmap, there is a link between the recommendations and the current key work areas of TEFINET, the key work areas being accreditation, TEFI Connect, the learning strategy and scientific knowledge exchange. So in a sense, some of the work of the recommendations is continuing, is happening as I speak through TEFINET's key work areas. And what will happen is once the SLG is formed, the SLG will form working groups. There will be working groups formed within the SLG. These working groups will be entrusted each working group with a different recommendation to take forward a different recommendation. Where there is synergy between a recommendation and a key work area, that working group will work very closely with the team that is busy with the key work area in TEFINET to take the recommendation forward. There are some recommendations for which there are no current activities or key work areas in TEFINET. And one of them is the recommendation to diversify funding sources and obtain funding so that uh, TEFINET and the network is sustainable. And clearly that working group will then have to come up with a work plan to take that recommendation forward. Okay. So we currently have just launched, last week we launched our new learning strategy. Uh, the learning strategy has taken almost two years to be developed. There was widespread consultation with various partners, stakeholders, uh, current residents, uh, alumni in order to draw up the learning strategy. And the next step of the learning strategy will be its implementation. So just to give you an overview of the learning strategy, this is available on our website and you are more than welcome to peruse it at your leisure. So there are six uh, areas for the learning strategy. And once again, I, I beg your attention to please note that the learning strategy, the FLAC that developed the learning strategy did so being cognizant of the roadmap and being cognizant cognizant of our strategic planning that was taking place for the last couple of months. So there is also articulation between the goals and objectives of the learning strategy and the recommendations of the roadmap, as well as with our current, our new learning, our new, sorry, strategic plan. The first goal, the first uh, focus area of the learning strategy is that TEFINET is the, should be the learning hub all right, and to build learning leadership and drive a learning culture. And I think the important thing to note is that we are striving for a culture of lifelong learning in FETP residents and, and graduates because there are so many technological advances, so many scientific advances all the time that, you know, in order to keep up in your field, you've got to actually be constantly updating yourself. And it's our desire is to instill this lifelong learning in, in residents. The second focus area is to ensure robust staff professional development. As I mentioned earlier, we also have to ensure that FETP trainers, mentors, supervisors are adequately capacitated in order to nurture and supervise and mentor FETP residents. Thirdly, the high quality learning experience with the third focus area, which resonates with one of the recommendations of the roadmap, that we really need to measure and improve learning outcome quality for our residents. 
Fourthly, there should be a global culture of knowledge sharing and resources. So we need to identify the gold standard learning solutions, right? And we need to share this glo globally. Fifthly, there should be workforce upskilling, okay, to enable alumni to constantly update their knowledge and skills. Okay, and that's also to ensure that they are prepared at any point in time to be called upon to be enlisted uh, if they are needed for a cross-border outbreak or for a pandemic of the current nature that we're dealing with. And there will be future pandemics, that's, that's a given. And sixthly, lastly, that there should be progressive evolution and growth in terms of learning, that learning needs are never static, all right? And we need to strengthen the regional network learning and support model that we currently have. Okay, so um, in terms of the recommendation that I mentioned, there's a few for which we don't have work areas in TEFINET is for example, recommendation number seven, the SLG should work to ensure sustainable funding for all elements of the FETP enterprise. So that was just the last, uh, just to remind you that there are recommendations for which the working groups that are formed from the SLG would have to develop work plan plans to take forward. Okay, so in terms of our uh, TEFINET strategy with regards to the roadmap, with regards to our uh, strategic plan and with regards to our uh, learning strategy, we want to continue, we will continue our work organizing and supporting the formation of the strategic leadership group and its working groups in order to move the roadmap recommendations forward to ensure implementation. Uh, we, are, we expect to disseminate our new strategic plan during the month of December, so that is before the end of 2020. And then once again, just as a reminder, that TEFINET is a global network of FETP, and we do depend on our key partners, such as all of you. We do depend on our stakeholders, on our trainees, and on our graduates. And we, we need to collaborate with our regional networks, our FETP directors, fellows, and graduates in order to move the whole enterprise forward in terms of all the recommendations of the roadmap. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, Susan, I'd like to hand over to you. Um, well, you can you can preliminary hand over to me, Carl. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm rich, sorry, <laughs> no, no, sorry. No worries at all. Thank you for your uh, talk, which kind of highlights the, the unification we also want to create in the FETP brand to kind of ensure that we're all growing to the needs of our country, but find some synergy. I saw a lot of really good questions um, and I, you know, it's a shame that we just have one session and I want to maybe say to the audience that we will keep all these questions in mind for that one day when we will come together and organize that nice conference on field epidemiology um, in the European context. For time's sake, if we have some time at the end, we'll definitely come back to some of the questions. Um, sure. I would like to emphasize to everybody that under your video, the poll options are still open, so you can still respond. And with that, I'll give it over to Susan. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Carl and uh, Amrish. So, um, from the uh, Nigerian perspective, back to global perspective, and now back to Europe, um, I'm happy to introduce Adam Roth. Um, Adam and I met about 20 years ago, actually, in London, both on a training course, uh, but uh, we disappeared for uh, several years after in different paths. Um, Adam is now heading the fellowship program at ECDC. He's a medical doctor specialized in clinical microbiology, PhD in epidemiology. Uh, so ideally suited, I'd say, to cover the both paths at uh, the ECDC fellowship program. He worked both in low income and high income countries, including uh, Guinea-Bissau, New Caledonia, uh, working with Pacific Island countries, uh, Denmark and Sweden. And um, yeah, I'll hand over to Adam to talk about EPIET and uh, looking back a bit to the consultation, but also into the future. The floor is yours, Adam. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, yeah, that was really an uh, unforgettable uh, course at the uh, London School. It was during the 9-11 that we were there. Um, 
Yes, so it's a real honor to be here today and speaking to all of you and uh, talk about this fantastic program. And in doing so, I think it's really important when we have the perspective of saying where we've come from and where we're going to really uh, see, see and state that there are so much already done, so many achievements and such big structures that are in place that we need to build upon uh, when, when uh, uh, doing this. So, uh, and, and in this picture that I have in front of you, I think it's a good way of doing it. Uh, these are uh, 31 uh, acknowledged EPIET sites and 19 acknowledged UFEM sites uh, and uh, that have been active. And it also pictures uh, the many fellows that have passed through during these 25 years. So counting uh, the 28 fellows graduating yesterday of the cohort 2018, it's some 546 fellows that have graduated. And I think it's really important that we build up on these uh, successes uh, that and 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 run the program. I mean, that's what we've got to do, uh, but still do some uh, important changes in order to meet the all challenges that uh, that uh, we have we are facing that we all know of. Uh, and how to do this uh, in such a long program and big program. And I think it's nice to take a stance in the, the recent external evaluation uh, that was finished in 2019 and the consultations that we've done after that. And uh, reflecting what I just said, uh, the evaluation was in general very positive. Uh, the aims and objectives of the program are relevant. Uh, where it's the, the, the program uh, does a contribution to increase the capacity in member states and contributes to the network of public health professionals that uh, through speaking a common language can effectively respond to cross-border threats in a, a more harmonized way. But it also raises uh, several challenges and I won't list them all, but I'll take a few that I think are important and will form the way we have to work and justify some, uh, some improvement uh, changes that we are, we are to do. So we should clarify the fellowship program format. We should address inequalities in how member states benefit from uh, the program. We should also simplify uh, and effectivize uh, administrative processes. And uh, we should also uh, update curricular processes in a systematic way, taking input from the training sites. Now, looking at this uh, day where we, we're celebrating the 25 years of EPIET, I think it's nice to do it in this uh, graph where we're following all fellows having been offered to enroll over the, over the years. And as we can see, it started out with EPIET in the light blue in the bottom and uh, uh, then followed soon by EPIET associated programs joining in in, uh, in, in grey. And then up till 2011, uh, the, the number of fellows have been growing and since then quite stable until the last two years when then UK is not among the associated programs. Uh, very importantly, uh, in 2008, uh, there was an introduction of UFEM. So the path, uh, we then had two paths, one for uh, public health microbiology and one for intervention epidemiology. And through the consultations, it's been clear that the current two-path uh, two uh, format is the way we should continue. And uh, in order to meet uh, sp uh, needs of specialization, whilst in this format also working for further interdisciplinarity. Uh, another important thing that we can see in this, uh, this uh, graph is that um, uh, the, the member state track was introduced in 2011. And this was as in, in, in response to the uh, external evaluation of 2010. And then again, then also followed by a member state track in, in UFEM. This is important because this is also, uh, what it was found important for the, for the uh, fellowship and also something that in consultations have seen as a mechanism that could be strengthened in order to meet uh, uh, the needs of, of countries that are underrepresented in the, in the fellowship. Uh, the fellowship programs have also been uh, uh, edited after, uh, as a response to the evaluation not asking you to read all of these, but basically I could lift up that prevention and preparedness have, have become clearer. Also, 
that uh, to, we need to have response mechanisms and contribute to response in cross-border threats and also going from uh, more European to a global uh, network view. Uh, uh, and then, uh, importantly, as I've lifted out in green there in the last, there's a new uh, objective, and uh, this is to contribute to the reduction of disparity um, across Europe in the prevention, preparedness, surveillance and control of infectious diseases. And I think this objective is really important for, uh, if we're to meet that, that really needs to form the way we work. And. Uh, the representation and I think this uh, picture here in a sense uh, shows this nicely. Uh, here we've reduced the, the data set, we're only looking at the, the, the same data but only on the EU track fellows and we have uh, uh, hosted and uh, or sent out and or hosted uh, fellows sent out to the left and hosted to the right and as you can see some member states have not hosted or sent any fellows and some member states more have only sent out a few fellows. So there are clearly differences in the way countries have, have benefited from the program. So this is a big challenge. Um, now, for any changes to work, uh, we need to work on our administrative processes. Uh, they should be simplified according to the, the external evaluation, and I have high hopes that we can soon present uh, a, an option for, for simplified ways of hosting uh, fellows. And I also think that this is uh, really interlinked with any, any attempts we can have in addressing underrepresentation. There are also working groups formed already uh, to, to work with this of underrepresentation and also the, the large, uh, some of the large processes that uh, build up the fellowship, such as the selection, international assignments and curricul curricular revision. Now, this is work has started and it's partly hampered, of course, by the COVID uh, situation, but I have uh, high hopes for this uh, also to, to come to fruition during the coming year, that where we can have some uh, good uh, improvement processes starting. Now, looking at COVID uh, and the situation we're in and, that, and saying that we're supposed to contribute to preparedness, I'd like just to, to present a picture that I like of preparedness, especially in these days. I think it might be uh, relevant uh, uh, with Christmas coming up. Well, basically with, with, with uh, our society being a Christmas tree and all the plans and structures and collaborations that we've set in place that we call preparedness as the, the Christmas decorations. And that we've seen now that the, the tree is uh, rocked a bit, uh, quite strongly so uh, during COVID, that uh, we're not all that prepared uh, that we perhaps hoped for. Uh, but still that there are very, and this is of course, I mean, this has been discussed a lot, uh, where this has not worked so good at, at the international and regional level and, and, and local level, etc. But I also think it's worth when talking training and preparedness that there are many things that are working. Looking through the presentations of the sky, the reporting of our fellows and their work uh, in, in COVID response, there's so much worth in uh, what people know and, and in the skill of people. Basically, the need for uh, being able to, to set up a diagnostic uh, test or uh, automatize uh, sur surveillance uh, data. Uh, this is really what is needed and this is what I would call real preparedness and where uh, training is just so very central. Um, we should also learn, I think, uh, importantly for the future from from the uh, the, the COVID, uh, both in, in that that it is a lowered digital threshold, um, uh, both for our digital tools uh, that we've introduced into the work with surveillance a lot, but also in the way we run the program. Currently, the whole program is run. Uh, through uh, through digit digital uh, means, this is really uh, cumbersome, but also fantastic in in, in that uh, that we we're learning so much from this, and that we see that th there are ways that this could add to the program. Now, looking at then how we should update our curriculum in order to meet the future needs, I think we should, as mentioned before, we should initiatives. Uh, that that are there and the, the great work that is going with the, the ongoing revision of competences for applied epidemiology and the competency framework of the public health microbiology. 
But I also think that it's really a continuous quality improvement work. I think nobody here today could say this is where we need to go in order to meet future needs. But we need a process in place to take input from people like yourselves and people uh, of the broader network uh, and alumni of, of EPIET being on the ground and actually uh, having the finger on what is needed. So on that note, I'd like to pose a question to you that is coming in the poll, I think, right now. Uh, so could you, and uh, if you if you then write a word there, it could be a really long word if needed. Uh, please suggest additional skills that we need in intervention epidemiology and public health microbiology training for our discussion later on. So uh, I see as my role and my team's role, a lot of the work is to establish good ways of working. And there are so many good ways of working within the program already. Uh, so much of it is uh, ways of working that we need to safeguard, some that we perhaps need to enhance, and some that we could perhaps also introduce. And I, I think I should really, by service that has been mentioned before, is, is really key, of course, and should be safeguarded. Uh, I think we could also see the program uh, to work more uh, systematically with in, uh, innovation and to, to, because I think fellows are really well put and as a resource to introduce innovation in, in, in member states. And um, uh, as said, using digital tools wherever these can add value, both in running the program and in the way that we work with surveillance, etc. Uh, also, the, the evaluation really stressed that we could be more flexible in some aspects. And I think this is true. Uh, and it could become, uh, the, the program could become more agile in this way to have some more at least flexible parts of curriculum and, and format. Uh, interdisciplinarity, I think this should not only be fostered within the program, which it really is doing currently a lot, but it should also, I think, drive interdisciplinarity within uh, member states. So, um, Looking then at uh, the final one, collaborations, I couldn't stress that more. We should work in, in collaborative efforts. And I think we're doing this currently a lot every week with our Epiated Associated programs, for instance. And I want to lift out the opportunities that are going to that we're going to run Medipiet also from ECDC. And I think there are so many opportunities coming out from this uh, uh, more parallel and uh, ways of running the two programs, both for both programs, both Medipiet and the ECDC Fellowship Program. And of course, as mentioned very nicely, both by Chico and Carl, uh, any other type of international partners and European uh, collaborations that are now also simplified by uh, working more digitally. Finally, uh, on a day like this, I really also want to lift up the uh, very inspiring and dedicated people that are behind and uh, th living in and through these networks uh, without whom this presentation just would never have existed. So uh, I, I'm mentioning nobody here by name, uh, therefore hoping to be inclusive. All current and uh, alumni, EPIET and UFM fellows, training site supervisors and scientific coordinators, these trio being the core of this program. The training sites and their forums and uh, uh, the EPIET associated programs as mentioned, uh, all other international partners and, and last and not least of course ECDC, of which much of the organization really supports this program so strongly. and. Uh, training site section and the fellowship group who really lives in this program and have done so for the 25 years. So thank you all. Yeah, thanks Adam. I think that's, uh, that's a very nice overview and uh, of the current situation and future plans. And I'm, I'm really happy that uh, you presented such a clear vision of uh, both being more um, egalitarian in Europe and also the, the agility, the, that are two things that uh, stand out for me. And I think uh, it is really linked to lifelong learning, both as a program, but as individuals as well. So um, now I've seen this uh, word cloud coming up. I don't know if you have access uh, to it. We could uh, briefly discuss it. I think we have about one minute actually, which is not a lot, but uh, there we go. Can you see it at all? I can see it right now. Uh, I see communication as the biggest word. Yep. And leadership as the second biggest. 
Yeah. So I think that's the third. And lots of very interesting word. Yeah, I, I quickly made a screenshot actually to uh, to make sure this is this is captured. Um, yeah, communication. So we have to make sure we're we're not muted. Linking back to uh, to Chiquis, uh, have to make our voices heard. What what do you think in Appiet? Uh, how does that yeah, resonate? I think with this you? is this is something that comes out all the time when we talk about what we need to enhance. I mean, risk communication and communication skills, leadership skills. This is really an easy. Uh, this is for sure where we need to go, I think, as well uh, to, to enhance this. So that, that, that doesn't surprise me that it comes out as a big, uh, very big thing. And uh, we're already working with it, and I think we're working with it also uh, much in, in the learning by service as well. It, it's, it's, a, it's a stream throughout the way uh, fellows work, but for sure we should work on it more. Hmm. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I guess our time is running out. Um, but just one question, how about all the technical data science, big data, um, legal aspects? How do you think about that? Should we really uh, broaden our skills or should we go back to shoe leather epidemiology as Stephen Nielsen was asking earlier in the session? I think we, in a sense, uh, like, like was mentioned by Chikwe, I, I think we need to go both ways. And I think if, uh, future uh, epidemiologists of Europe should know and, and, it, and, and that, that the program should also enhance uh, or, or encompass both of those aspects. I think you learn different parts of that and, and necessarily in the systems and the complex systems that are in some of the European countries, we definitely uh, should uh, take on uh, the, the the challenges of new big data and digital data and uh, for sure I think we're going to go there uh, anyways. Mm. Yeah I agree and uh, the data landscape is just richer and richer every day and I guess the uh, working uh, interdisciplinary is uh, maybe a skill we need to uh, enhance. So I think with that our time is up unfortunately so I, I'll have to hand over to uh, to Ambrish um, and we'll go to a slightly more informal part of this session. But thanks again, uh, Adam, for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also from my side, thanks to all three speakers. Um, I think you really touched the core of what these programs have brought, and um, maybe also what EPIAT has brought in the last 25 years, uh, how much hard work went into that, and how important it will be to, to augment it in the best way possible without creating redundancies of the most essential things. Um, I'm increasingly becoming worried, especially during the pandemic, that the word field or the shoe letter epidemiology part is disappearing from the work that we are doing. Um, indeed, there is a risk in just staring at data and like we said, not making our voices heard. And we've all seen the effects of that. And especially working on the humanitarian side of, of epidemiology. That's something we clearly see with many more challenges coming towards us. Even though with all these challenges, there's some, um, we do need to celebrate some now, so now and then as well, because we need to revitalize ourselves and take care of ourselves as well. And uh, I think one of the strong things that has kept me upright was really the network that we have shaped, not just with our European counterparts in the EPIAT alumni network, but also far beyond our borders with our colleagues from TEFINET and then the wider networks around it and how quickly we found each other. Going back to our polls at the beginning, just out of curiosity, knowing how many of our alumni are around and how many of the alumni are um, in the from the first five years all around and attending this session. Um, I can't really see the polls. Oh yeah, there they are. So um, I see that we have about 60% A and 60% B, which I assume is yes and no. So we have about 60% of the uh, um, attendants are alumni of the program and about 14% of those are um, alumni from the first five years. And um, yeah, I'm happy to see that, that we're always able to pull each other together, um, you know, picking from those memories we all have built over the years. And that when need is arise or when we just have want to have a nice drink, lemonade or beer that we quickly manage to find each other. The other thing, the poll that we had, of course, was the question around 
you know, what is it in one word? What do we most cherish from the program? And uh, for that purpose, we have a word cloud. Um, and I hope that it's kind of going to appear on the screen now and that I can see it somewhere else as well. Yeah, I see a lot of nice words, but also at the center point, the word community is definitely the highlight of it. Um, and there are other beautiful words in there as well. Family, um, some less public health responsible words like alcohol um, is in there as well. And um, I think it also comes forward from the, the word cloud in Adam's session that one of the nice things of these word clouds of what we cherish most, yes, of course, the fundamental of the technical training, but all of the other things, uh, the leadership, the network is actually what keeps us strong um, and something that we should build on, um, which I think is very evident to us. I hope we can um, continue many of these discussions in, in the coming years as well on an informal basis as we initially planned. But um, what we really would have liked to see is, of course, all of us together in, in Warsaw um, with a nice pre-conference uh, discussing many of the questions that have been asked uh, in the chat in, in much more depth. Um, and after that, indeed, closing with a nice social celebration as only the network and the extended people can do. Um, unfortunately, reality is how it is, and definitely it's something we still have uh, on our planning fund for when it's still possible. Um, but one of the nice initiatives that you saw from the network is that uh, Arnold, Stina, and, and Marianne Mullen have actually uh, gone out and they went out to interview a lot of the alumni in the network. Um, and these were a really nice interview with, you know, critical questions, questions of what people cherish out of the, the programs. And um, Arnold has nicely made it into a five minute compilation. So just to celebrate a little bit, uh, we want to give you and show you that, that, that really nice video. Um, so I hope it's going to start playing right about now. I think my favorite memory is actually going to Spetses, and um, which, which is the site where we receive our introduction training. But uh, I guess I must say that it, it was the three week introductory course, which was really sort of the, the hook to the whole program. The introductory week in, in, in Lazaretto. And, uh... At the time that was being, being held at uh, Veria du Lac by Lake Annecy, Le Pensier. The teachers were amazing. Uh, and meet 40 random strangers, uh, the vast majority who I haven't met before. And then during the course of two years, you become really good friends with each other. The opportunity of being together with people from so many different parts of the world, you know, in this uh, space, you know, learning so intensively <laughs> every day from morning to night so that your lunch, breakfast and dinner were filled with conversation. Part of learning and of course part you get to know yourself a bit. But... Um, and we spent three intensive weeks over there with, with a really tightly packed uh, training schedule. Not only the, uh, the method, um, but also the passion and the, the, the human uh, mission of uh, this job. So uh, I really appreciated uh, everyone because they were really high level persons uh, and teachers. Um, and that's definitely one of the warmest memories I have is you start as an individual in a relatively competitive process in terms of recruitment. You know, it was, it was really um, an introduction into what uh, uh, a future could look like. And, and in a way, I think that's still in, in, almost in parallel to the learning, uh, the, the network that has been built over the years uh, and how that has, in a way, in itself, is as much value as whatever we are, we are taught during the, the sessions. And you end up with a, a really warm network where, where you as professionals really know how to find each other. But then also in this fantastic environment over the weekends, we went uh, jogging, swimming, mountain climbing. Um, and how to make use of each other's skills and knowledge. Uh, paragliding some of us um, so it was just something that that uh, you know fulfilled all kinds of uh, dreams of adventure um, at that time um, but I would like to come back to the very first one uh, very very first to our introductory course because in that course uh, they, uh, they they had something that they gave have uh, abundant in the past in the in the following years and that was that in order to for us to bond better together, they let us into a cave. So we went into this cave 
the whole uh, introductory course. Uh, we got um, uh, uh, complete overalls, uh, rubber boots, helmets and lamps on the helmet. So it was really serious uh, cave uh, exploring. And we had guides and, you know, it was really scary. It was absolutely scary. So we had to uh, go down into holes with a, with a, with a rope. We had uh, to slide um, through dark places, squeeze through. But the best afterwards was that we came into a big, um, yeah, a bigger cave where they had champagne and candlelight for us. I hope you all enjoyed that video. We will definitely make sure that the video is shared amongst the network and that you can all have uh, a look in the more detailed interviews that were conducted with many of the people that you saw in the video, but also many of the people that were not in the video yet. Um, with that, I would like to thank all our speakers again for attending the session. I would like, I would like to uh, thank Suzanne as well for co-hosting it with me. Also Francisca, who couldn't make it today to join us. And I am... Um, Hope to see you all in person very soon. Yeah, thanks, Amrish. And thank you all for participating. And uh, yeah, it's been a great session and a great end with this video. Thanks to the people who made it. Very warm uh, memories to uh, 25 years. So um, yeah, this is the end of the, the last formal session. So um, I think we're handing back now to uh, Martin in the studio.